So December 25th, 2021 might be a day that doesn't mean much to you, but it's a day that's proving to kind of reshape the way we're looking at the universe because that is the day that the James Webb Telescope was launched up into space. It launched from uh, South America, launched from a rainforest, and literally the commentator said, there it goes from the rainforest to the edge of time, all the way back to the birth of our universe. And it's been a very eye-opening thing over the, over the couple of years that it's been working and moving and sending pictures back, and it's beginning to sort of reshape some of our understanding about the universe and the world that you and I live in. Here's one of its first pictures that it sent back. This is called First Light. And this is an amazing picture because it's just a very small piece of the night sky that you and I see every single night. Very small piece. But in this, not only are there stars, but more, more so, even more than stars, these, the majority of what is up here are other galaxies, just like the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. And so they're estimating that not only, so the, the Milky Way galaxy has something like maybe 400 billion stars in it. And then you look out into the universe and there's something like another 150, maybe million, whatever billion, uh, just a bunch of other galaxies, all with the same amount of stars. It's a tremendous thing, the vastness and the, and the bigness of it. And it, you know, it reminds me of Isaiah 40, 12, where it, God says that he measures the universe by the span of his hand from, from his thumb to his pinky. God measures the universe, not the galaxy, but the whole universe that you and I live in. This is a tremendous God. But this picture reminds me of something else that as God looks down on this earth, this reminds me of Philippians 2.12 where it says that God wants us to shine as lights in the world. That as God looks down on his earth that the Bible says right now is enveloped in a canopy of darkness by Satan. It's enveloped and so it's, it's covered and, and, and we see that and we experience it. But as God looks down, this is the picture that God wants to see. That though his creation is right now covered in darkness, his people as individuals should shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and dark world. And that we as a church, as we gather together, we should be shining as lights in the midst of this dark world. And this is how God wants to see his people is in the midst of the darkness, you and I are shining. We're not given into the spirit of the age and to the spirit of the culture. We're not going down the stream just like everybody else doing what everybody else is doing. But yet we've turned our attention to who Jesus is and what Jesus wants to do in and through us out into the world that God loves, that God has created. He wants us to shine as lights, shine as stars, your Bible might say, in the midst of a crooked and dark or crooked and twisted generation. And how can we do this? Well, this is Jesus's vision for you and me. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 14, that you are the light of the world and a city on a hill, it cannot be hidden. Jesus tells us that as we stay focused on him and as we stay close to him and connected to him, that we are gonna be the light of the world. That as God looks down on his creation, his people should shine as lights and we are the light of the world, the light to the world. But what's important to understand is that we're not the source of the light. And this is very important, but we are to reflect. We, the reason that you and I are the light of the world is because we're connected to the source of light, which is Jesus himself in John 8, 12. And this is what it says. Jesus began to speak to them and he said, I am the light of the world. So you and I are to shine like stars. How? By staying connected to Jesus and reflecting the joy of Jesus into this cynical and angry and bitter culture and world that we live in. Imagine it like this. If you turn this lamp on, that it gives off a certain amount of light. And what Jesus is saying is that he is the light. And that you and I are to stay connected and to stay close to him and to keep our eyes focused upon who he is. And as long as we stay focused and, and invested and all in on who Jesus is, as long as we're connected to him and our faces are turned towards him, that we are gonna be able to reflect his light into the world and to be able to do what he tells us we can do, which is shine as lights in the midst of a dark world. But the reality is that sometimes our lights just grow dim. We're, we're shining at one point, but now over time, you might be feeling maybe even this morning, you're hearing this like, that sounds great. And at one time I used to experience that and I was all in on Jesus and I was so on fire for him. But now it's just, I feel a little lukewarm and I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure what to do about it. 
And so we need to ask, how does my light grow dim? If we are to shine as lights in the world because the light of the world is inside of us, then how does something grow dim? How does that, how does that go out even in the slightest little bit? And a couple of things that can happen, and, and you see these, and I'll point out one uh, throughout the Bible. But the first thing that can happen is that I just get complacent. Then one, at one point, I was all in. I was just on fire, coming to church, reading my Bible. Prayer was the, was the language of my life. And everything was about Jesus. But now, over time, it's not that I've completely turned away. I just, I got a little complacent. Whereas every day, I used to wake up an hour earlier to read my Bible now, when the alarm goes off, I'm like, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll hit snooze, and I'll hit snooze, and I'll hit snooze. And what it is, it's nothing dramatic, but it's that slow drift over time where nobody wakes up. None of us woke up one day and said, you know what? I think I'm going to get a little lukewarm on my following of Jesus today. That doesn't happen overnight, but it can happen in the small incremental moments where all of a sudden we're just a little complacent. Jesus is still there. He's in my peripheral. I still see him and I'm still focused on him and I'm still, he's still a part of my life. But really, I'm focused on all in on some other things that are going on in my life right now. He's a part of it, but I'm not focused on him any longer. And he just becomes a part of it. And it becomes just a complacency. One writer says it like this, by selling complacency as a virtue and mediocrity in following Jesus as a goal. So selling, virtue, uh, selling complacency as a virtue and mediocrity as a goal, Satan can lull us to sleep slowly and gently, so much so that we hardly notice it. It's just this slow drift where all of a sudden one day we're just sort of, I mean, I like Jesus. I mean, I, I still love him, but it, when I say he's the burning center of my life, I'm not so sure. But then, unfortunately, complacency doesn't stop. And the second thing that can happen, which complacency leads to, and that's pure compromise. Your light grows dim because you get complacent, and then complacency inevitably always, if you don't turn back, it will always inevitably lead to compromise, where you completely turn from Jesus to the world and begin to say, I am going to go in this direction, Still can be saved, still can be a follower of Jesus, still can be, but you're, you've turned from him. That doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. That just doesn't mean you're not, that means you're not focused on him. Now, for some of you, you've never turned from the world to Jesus. You've always just been looking this way. And today your first move needs to be, I'm gonna turn to him for the very first time. And we'll talk more about that towards the end of the message. But for some, you've just compromised. You see this in David, David, he got complacent. This led to the David and Bathsheba incident that many of you might know about, some of you might not. But this, he just gets complacent. His, it, most scholars think, you know, he, he, David was the conquering king and the army is out to fight. Well, David stays behind and he's just lounging around one day. He's just hanging out, not doing what God had shaped him and called him to do. He's just sort of, I'm gonna take a day off. And then in that complacency, he sees Bathsheba, which then that complacency turns to compromise. And when compromise happens, here's what's going to happen. I have compromised when my attitude and my words and my heart look more like the world around me than the Savior that's inside of me. That's when compromise has happened. When I have more in common with what's happening in the people around me who do not know Jesus and then the culture around me that does not honor Jesus, when I share their values, their principles, and their virtues, and I think, well, they make some sense, then you can guarantee you have not only become complacent, but you have moved into a compromising situation, which is going to dim your ability to shine as a light in the world. It will dim your ability to shine as a light of joy in your family. It will dim your ability to shine as a light of joy in your marriage. Dim your ability to shine as a light of joy in your work. Wherever you find yourself, where once you were shining with the brightness and the holiness of Jesus, now you shine with the reflection of everybody else around you. But we, there's, that's not the end of the story. It doesn't have to be the end of your story. If you find yourself there today, that doesn't have to be the end because the vision that Jesus has for you does not quit and it does not stop. God does not quit his vision and his desires for our life. And God says, I want you to be the light of the world, light to the world, because you're connected to the light of the world. That is Jesus's non-stopping vision for our lives. 
So no matter how far you may have compromised, you could be like, pastor, I'm all like, I didn't just compromise. Like I have completely like walked off all the way over here. What I want you to hear today is that Jesus' vision doesn't stop. He still wants you to be the light to the world because you're connected to the light of the world. And all it takes is a simple turn to come back to him. And the steadfast love of Jesus is always inviting you back and inviting you back. And if you will, no matter how far you've compromised away, I promise you, if you will just make the decision to say, that's it, enough's enough, I'm putting a stake in the ground and I am turning and I am coming back, what you will always, always, always hear from the heart of Jesus is come back, come home, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest and you can draw right in, right near to him once again. That's his invitation to you. So how do we do that? What do I do to burn bright in this world and to shine as a star, as Paul says. In the book of Philippians, as we've been looking at, they had moved into a place where they were a little complacent. They were focusing on some disagreements in, um, that were going on in their church. You can see over in chapter four, Paul calls out uh, Yudia and Syntyche and tells them that like, y'all got to agree because they were complacent and their complacency looked like this. They were more focused on the small disagreements that were dividing them than on the one big unifying agreement that Jesus is Lord that should unite them. They were distracted and complacent with all this other stuff instead of focusing on who Jesus is and what he has done and how he has shaping, is shaping them. And Paul, coming right off of this amazing uh, verse, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, this hymn of Jesus, where we see this the wonderful theology of Jesus that though he was equal with God, he did not count that a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing and he became like us, like you and me, he took on the form of a servant and became obedient, even to the point of obedience to the point of death. And because he died in our place and died in, in, in a death that he did not deserve, God has highly exalted him. And now he has the name, as Pastor Blake said a moment ago, the name that is above every name and that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's, that's this exaltation of Jesus and it's tremendous and it, it brings us up on this, that man, the, the light of the world, he's so amazing and he's so wonderful. And right out of that, Paul then launches into, okay, now, because of that because you see that here's how you live because here's the reality no matter what your theology of how strong your theology of Jesus is a theology of Jesus that is not lived is a weak theology if you don't live this thing out Jesus didn't say come get to know me a whole whole lot no Jesus said you come die to self and you follow me there's an obedience there so you might be able to pass the theological test but could you pass the life test that's what Jesus is, is, Paul is about to focus on. That's what Jesus always focused on. Follow me. Die to self. Follow me. So Paul says that we have got to follow Jesus. And the first thing that he encourages us to do to burn and shine bright is to partner with God. We've got to partner with God. God is doing something inside of you that you've got to partner with him in. Salvation is never in the Bible something that you and I merely receive. Salvation is something that we receive and then go out and live and do. That's, that, that's what it is. And so you see this in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. And then here's the directive. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I work out. So Jesus has put something inside of me. He is the light of the world. And so the light of the world has been, in, has been put inside of me to light up my soul and to bring this dead soul back to life, this dead spirit back to life. And now I'm to take that light that's been put inside of me and now I'm to work it out into the world that I live in, into, the, into my family, into my work, into my friendships, into my church, into every place that I go. I'm to work out what God has put inside of me. And an important distinction needs to be made here. Because it's very tempting to read this and think, well, I've got to work for my salvation. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says that you work out your salvation. We don't work for our salvation. We, we work out the salvation that we receive because Jesus did everything necessary so that you and I can be saved. 
He's done everything necessary. He said on the cross, everything, it is finished, meaning that he had completed every bit of the work that is necessary for salvation. So we don't work for salvation. We receive the salvation as a free gift of God by the grace of God that you put your faith in Jesus and by God's grace, you are then saved, called a child of God, redeemed and forgiven. And then you take what God gives to you by grace and then you work it out. So you're a completely saved person that now gets to work out what Jesus has done in your soul and done in your life. And you're to do it with fear and trembling. And that doesn't mean that we're to shake in our boots and be completely terrified. But there is an aspect where we should tremble a little bit when we're in the presence of Jesus. He should, he, we should be in awe of him. And sometimes in the church, we, we tend to lose this because we get a little too familiar. We get a little too comfortable. And we come up with phrases that like one that it's a little old now, but 10, 15 years ago, where Jesus becomes our homeboys. He's just a homeboy. And he's not a homeboy. Jesus is holy. And we need to see him as holy. And we need to understand him as holy. And we need to be like the disciples. I mentioned this last week. We need to be like the disciples in Mark 4 where Jesus calms, comes up from a, a nap and looks out at a storm and speaks a word and stops it right there. And the lake goes completely like glass. And they look at him and they say, what kind of man is this? Who is this? And you and I, we need to have that same awe, that same reverence, that same just, when I'm in his presence, like I'm just sort of in awe and blown away and, I, and he's our Lord. He is my everything and he is my life. And I, I stand here in holiness and, and tremble before him because of how wonderful and how glorious Jesus truly is. And we need to be in awe of Jesus with fear and trembling because that continues to work in his goodness, his joy, his grace inside of us so that we can work it out into our lives. And we must partner with him to do this. When I was about four or five years old, I was riding a four-wheeler with my uncle. And we were going along and what, to my right, so I was sitting in front of him and he was sitting behind and he had his hands on the handlebars and I had my hands on them as well. And to my right, it looked like just a deep ravine. Now, looking back, four or five years old, 10 feet is a, is a, might as well be the Grand Canyon. But it was more likely just a small ditch, maybe even three or four feet. But that just looked massive to me sitting up on that, that, that four-wheeler. And so as we were going along, and we were going along right on that edge, man, it, I was terrified. And I just, I kept turning that wheel, or those handlebars, I kept trying to push them to the left. And I would push them to the left and my uncle would pull them back because he's stronger than I am. And I continually trying to push it to the left and he would pull back. And so he finally stopped and he said, listen, I know you're worried about the ditch is all it was, is a ditch. I know you're worried about the ditch over here. But if you keep pulling us to the left, what you can't see over here is there's a mud hole and, and this whole area is mud and we're gonna get stuck. And there's one pathway through this place and you gotta let me guide you through here. So put your hands on mine and let me do the steering. I said, okay. And I just rested, put my hands on his, and every turn he made, my hands moved. But he was the one in control at that point. And that is the picture of how you and I partner with God. Because here's the reality. To the left is the culture, and it's a mud hole, and you're going to get stuck in life. I promise you. To the right is the ditch of cynicism, and you don't want to fall into that. The only pathway towards joy is the pathway that uh, through the mud hole of cynicism and the ditch uh, uh, that, that you can get stuck in. The only way through is a path that Jesus can carve for you, and you must partner with him. You put your hands on his, and he guides you. What's his desire? What's his will? Where is he leading? What does he want you to do? What does he want you to say? We work out what God has put inside of us. And we partner with God. He is present. He is working. He is moving in your life. The second thing that Paul encourages us to do is that we've got to displace cynicism with contribution. Cynicism is primarily, one of the main ways it gets expressed in our life is through complaining. We just complain. We're so bitter. We're so angry. There's no restitution, no resolution. And we're cynical. So we just, we just complain about everything. And it's complain, complain, complain. And here's the reality. You can complain your way into cynicism or you can contribute to the solution, but you can't do both at the same time. You can complain, 
and, and maybe get something off of your chest, but it will not solve a thing. Or you can contribute to the solution. What you can't do is try to do both of those at the exact same time. It's, it just won't work. And that's, that's where Paul challenges us. Now, these next few words, they're about, they, they hit us like right between the eyes here. All right. Here's what verse 14 says. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. That never gets an amen. <laughs> like we go up here to verse 11. Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And everybody's like, oh, yes, amen, all right. And then Paul's like, do all things without grumbling and questioning. What? Yeah. This is, this is 100% inclusive. Do all things without grumbling, without disputing, what some Bibles might say, without arguing. And you, and you think, okay, so is Paul talking about that, that one area? I mean, that person's really difficult. And my, my response would be, yeah, he's talking about that one thing. Do all things without grumbling, without complaining, or without grumbling, without questioning. And the picture here of grumbling and questioning is that idea of murmuring and secret talk. Secret talk and murmuring with an ill intent and an ill will, looking to harm and to maybe damage another person. That's the picture. Do all things without that. That would include gossip as well. And gossip is one of those, it's very, it's very powerful in our lives. It's so easy. It's like cynicism. It's so easy to join in when people get to gossiping. And, and we've tried all kinds of, I mean, we, we try workarounds. We've tried loopholes. I've had people as a pastor, I've had people, man, a lot of different ways they try to loop around gossip. I mean, you know, there, there's the classic, you know, we're praying way where, you know, you, you walk up, hey, have you heard about sister so-and-so? No, I haven't heard. Oh, we got to pray for her. Let me tell you what's going on. And then it proceeds. And you might say, oh, but I was praying on no ill intent. Yeah. I had another person say, oh, oh Pastor, listen, I prom- it wasn't gossip because we were in our small group and we were talking about that other person to encourage one another. <laughs> That's what we call it. No, uh, Paul's like, listen, do all things without murmuring, without secret talk, without talking about others behind their back. And that's challenging, but that's, that's the pathway out of, of compromise, complacency. That's the pathway back to the joy of Jesus is to, to abstain from this behavior, but then also to pick up others. So we do all of this. We work out our salvation. We do all things without grumbling and complaining so that verse 14 and 16 might be true, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. This idea is that, that, that whatever accusation the world or anyone else makes against one of God's people or against one of God's churches, they don't stick. Why? Because we have lived our lives without grumbling, without complaining. We have worked out the joy of our salvation into our lives and others have experienced that and others have seen that and they have been around. They have, the, the joy has sloshed over onto them. And when others say, you know, that first small bluff church, you know, they're just not very kind. It should not stick. They should be like, well, that's never been my experience. I mean, they serve our community. They love whenever you go there. They're so welcoming. They're so loving. They're so friendly. They invite you right in. That should be how people experience us. And that's how people should continue to experience our church. And that's how people should continue to experience you as a follower of Jesus. That when someone says, you know, that that guy over there, like, he's just so grumpy. It's like, that's never been my experience. Like, he might have had a bad day. But overall, man, he's, he's a bright light. He's a joy. And he talks about this Jesus that he follows all the time and how Jesus's joy is inside of him. And that makes his joy complete. That, I mean, that, that's my experience with him. Because the reality is, Christian grump should never exist. I mean, those two words just should not go together. I mean, Jesus said, your jo- my joy is in you so that your joy will be complete. Your joy will overflow is essentially what he said. So the idea of a Christian grump, that, that's just, that's foreign to Jesus. That would never fly in Jesus. He just does not see that, doesn't understand. There's no way that that can be true. A Christian full of joy is who we are called to be. And again, it's easy to jump in and complain. And that's what we could do. But then the moment that we do, we'll get complacent, we'll compromise, and no longer will our light shine like God has the vision that it can shine. You can, you can complain your way towards cynicism, or you can contribute to the solution. 
I have a friend whom I deeply love and respect. He's been a part of my life through different seasons. And he's in the city of Memphis. And the city of Memphis, many of you probably don't know about it. Maybe some of you do, but it is an angry, angry city. It's got a history of just anger from the racism that is prevalent there. It's got fractured homes, fractured families. The school system is, is terrible. The gang violence just has almost overrun the city in some places. And the people of Memphis, I've li- I lived there most of my life, was born there. It is, it is a complaining city. They complain about each other. They complain about the city. They complain about the politics. They complain about everything. And it's just full of anger. And my friend took his wife, he and his wife took their young family and they moved right into one of the toughest areas in all of the city of Memphis and planted a church right there in the middle of it because they loved that city and their mentality was we can be, we can contribute to the complaining or we can bring a solution, which is a new church bringing the light of Jesus into a dark world, into a crooked and twisted generation. And so that's what they chose to do. And they're still to this day, that was about 10 or 15 years ago, they're still to this day plowing forward, bringing the light. And it's tough. They're pushing against the darkness, but they're bringing the light of Jesus to where it needs to be brought into the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Mercy Hill Church in Memphis, it's a a wonderful place. But that's also, we're moving into this idea. We're going to talk about it next week. We're, we're moving into what we call our Multiply campaign. We're, we're going to plant a new campus up in Ritter. Why? Because we want to be people who bring the light of Jesus to every community. Every community deserves the light of Jesus. Every community deserves a church that brings the light of Jesus. And the reason for that is, is we have to keep moving forward and keep pushing forward. And here's the reality. There's not enough churches until everybody's saved, y'all. There's not enough churches until everybody's saved. As long as there's people to be reached, more churches need to be started. And we want to be a people who bring the joy and the light of Jesus into every community that we can and into every place that God gives us opportunity. We don't want to get complacent. We could just get complacent and sit right here. Our, pl- our church is amazing and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and we love one another. We love our Moss Bluff community and we could get complacent right here. But if we do, the first thing that's going to happen is we're not going to just stay in complacency. We might find ourselves in compromise. And the only way to, uh, to fight back and push back against all of that is to get on on mission with Jesus, to stay focused on Jesus and to go where Jesus tells us to go and to do what Jesus tells us to do. And that's our heart. That's our goal. And we want to burn bright and shine bright the light of Jesus. So how do you do this as an individual? How do I shine bright the light of Jesus? A couple of things I would suggest to you. First, I would encourage you to turn your complaints into prayers. To turn your complaints into prayers. Life is hard and life is complex and relationships are difficult and they're sticky and they're messy. And, you know, following Jesus would be just, it would be the joy of the world, but then other people come along and people are difficult sometimes and we're, we're messy when we're together at times. And so it's very easy to, to just fall into the complaint pathway and just complain, complain, complain. The encouragement of the Bible is to, instead of complain, Turn that into a prayer. This is the model of the Psalms. David, as we talked about a moment ago, he was a man who experienced more hardship than many of us face. He was a guy who was run out of his kingdom and run off of his throne by his own son who wanted to take over and throw him out and and kill him. And David had more things that he could have complained about, perhaps than any of us here in this room have. He could complain about anything and everything, but yet here's what he does in Psalm 142. With my voice, I cry to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him and I tell my trouble before him. He takes his complaints and he brings them to the Lord in prayer. He brings them to the one, the only one who can can actually do anything about it. So we can complain and that solves nothing or we can pray and see what God might have in store and see what God might do. Because if you take the complaint route, you can't complain your way to joy, but you can pray and praise your way to joy. No matter what you're facing, And some of you, I understand, you've got some very difficult things going on in your life right now. And it's tempting and easy to try to just complain. You're never going to find joy at the end of that road. 
But if you turn that complaint into a prayer and praise of Jesus, there is joy at the end of that road. That doesn't mean everything will get fixed, but you can, be a, you can shine as a light in the midst of that crooked and dark situation. Turn your complaints into prayers. Secondly, I got to get the light of Jesus in me. You got to get the light inside of you. You can't be a light to the world and shine the joy of Jesus to the world if the light of the world and the joy of Jesus is not inside of you. This is what we would call, this is why Jesus taught about this. This is death to self. So Jesus first remind you of what he says in John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And Jesus, whenever he says, whoever follows me, he has something in mind there. Because to follow him means to take up our cross and die to self so that we follow him. Here's what it says in Luke 14, 27. This is Jesus again. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me or follow me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear their cross, whoever will not, whoever refuses to die to self, whoever refuses to set their own will, their own desires, their own plans, their own wants, their own needs, whoever refuses to set those to the side and follow Jesus, you can't follow him any other way. You must die to self. And the only way to do that is at the foot of the cross. So what that means for some of you that I mentioned at the beginning when we started all of this, your position and your posture right now is you're facing this way and you're, you're, you're running as fast as you can to try to get away from Jesus and you've never turned to him. You've never decided to follow him. You've never become a Christian. And today, the invitation is to stop running and to turn and run to him. And his invitation is come to me, all who are weary, all who are heavy laden. Because running away from him, trying to figure it out in the world and living in anger and bitterness and cynicism, that's a weight that none of us can carry. But if he says, you come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. You will not find rest outside of Jesus. My, my plea for you is, is come to him today. Give him your life. Don't hold out any longer. What has this got for you? It's gotten you nothing up to this point. Turn to him. He has everything. And I plead with you to turn today. Give your life to him. Become a follower. Become a Christian. For others, there was a time in your life, you, you are a believer, you follow Jesus, but maybe you're in that complacent point or maybe you've compromised and maybe you've compromised so much that you have sort of walked away a little bit. And again, as I said a moment ago, you can turn because the steadfast love of Jesus never stops. And his vision for your life to shine as a star in the midst of a crooked and dark world he never gives up on that, and he will not and has not given up on you. Will you turn and come back to him? Will you move towards his way? And maybe you've got something going on in your life, and you're just, it, it, as I said a moment ago, as we were talking about turning complaints into prayers, just God brought something to your heart and just, yep, that thing, that relationship, that family situation, that work situation, that you just, it's so easy to get on this spiral of complaining. And God's just, it's time to stop that complaint, stop it in its tracks and bring it to me and receive the joy of Jesus that you can then turn and bring back into that crooked and dark situation. If you will, bow your heads. I wanna invite you to do something. Right where you're sitting, if you're ready to just say, I'm gonna make a commitment. Whether you've been a believer for a while and maybe you've compromised or wherever you are, if you want to, if you want to walk in the light, if you want to have the light of the world shining brightly in your life so that you can work out your salvation and shine the light of Jesus to others. Here, here's, here's what I wanna ask you to do. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I just wanna ask you just to hold out your hands in front of you like you're, like you're about to receive something. And just hold your hands there. 
And then while you're there, ask the Lord, God, fill me with the light of Jesus. Fill me with the joy of Jesus. And just take a moment and receive what God gives to you. God, we're so thankful that you meet us where you are. We're so thankful for the promises of your word that we can come to you and find rest, that you fill us with your joy, that you put your light in us. And God, I pray for all of us here, all of us watching online. God, I pray that we would wholeheartedly receive the light and the joy that you want to put into our lives. Father, help us in this moment. Meet us here in this moment. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.